Oh, now, would you look at that? I hope you can hear me. I'm going to sort of tuck myself behind a, a large bush here because it's very windy. Second week of lots of wind. Um, thank you for the wind impression, Neil. Oh, pleasure. You might be able to hear uh, a slight creak behind me. I'll probably have to get closer to it. Yeah, it might be a bit too far away at the moment. But um, I'm at um, Wilton Windmill. An undou- I'm, I'm reading here, this isn't me ad-libbing. An undoubted treasure in the Vale of Pusey. Wilton Windmill is the only working windmill in Wessex. A five-storey brick town mill built in 1821 to replace five water mills made redundant when the Kennet and Avon Canal took their water. The mill was built with a fan tail. Ah, I see. Yep, I can see that. You'll see it in a moment because I'll put this on the show page today. Which causes the cap supporting the sails to turn and make best use of the prevailing wind. It's sort of, uh, it's turned away from me, which is a great shame. But I'll try and get uh, another angle from it because there's a, a footpath that goes around it. Let me get a picture for you before we start the photo walk. So I'm going to have to have a wide angle on this one because uh, otherwise I'm just not going to get it in. So I've got my... My, 12, my, my Samsung 12 millimeter on, 500th of a second, ISO 400, F5.6, and in focus, there we go. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production. We were, stroke R, supposed to be going on our school half-term holidays soon on the, on the Isle of Wight, which is a, which is a favorite for three families. Who, who get together every year, us and two other families, except, of course, for last year, for obvious pandemically-driven reasons. So we thought we'd try 2021 instead. What could possibly go wrong? Huh. Oh. Well, one of the little ones in, our, in the other families had a positive COVID test, so she can't come out until almost halfway during the week, which is such a shame. And I know she's, she's been doing a countdown, this, uh, this girl. She's been doing it for, oh, for months you know, two months to go, one month to go, three weeks to go, two weeks to go, and then she has a positive test. So, um, so yeah, so that, that family can't come out until uh, halfway during the week. And that little one's brother is our, our eldest's best friend, and they are cheek by jowl, and I spend my time driving the two of them back and forth from school and events and, and sports and stuff. So now as I, as I speak, the testing game has started. And I'm shoving those, uh, those, those long earbuds up my nose, down the back of my throat, like there's no tomorrow. Oh. Um, we're on this, this sort of waiting game now. If, 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 if we go, then I'm taking a load of your letters to record a special photo walk. Because the Isle of Wight is, um, oh, we love that place. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's on the south. If you don't know where the Isle of Wight is, because if you live in Ukrainian land, you won't. Um, it's on the south coast of, uh, of England. Um, it's a little island just off the coast. There's a, there's a small estuary between it called the Solent, um, but it is effect- effectively an island of its own. I mean, it, it could raise a flag and be an independent country if it could support itself on ice cream sales, perhaps. But uh, it, it is, I mean, it does feel like uh, it's a, a land that time forgot. It's got incredible unspoiled woodland, a steam railway that makes you feel like you're, you're actually living back in the 30s. In fact, they use, and there's also an, a main line, which is uh, the old tube trains of London. They gave them the old tube trains of London. And some of these trains, I'm sure I'm right in saying they're 70 years old. I mean, it's a heritage railway in itself. And that's the main line railway. And, um, and it's got a, a Jurassic coast or Jurassic walks where it's, uh, where it's really not hard to find tangible hold them in your hand clues to a time when creatures with uh, with big teeth and long tails and very bad breath were in charge but um right now in this world our world this time ugh, where you used to be able to plan stuff by the time you hear this i might just be sitting in my office wishing uh, we lived in a time when creatures with big teeth long tails and very bad breath ruled the world again ugh. can you imagine by the way t-rex trying to put a mask on i can't reach my face this is annoying it's not evolution who invented these let me eat him hey hey calm down mr t-man give the master velociraptor he's a whiz with his front claws go on no wonder they were angry all the time 
Anyways, my holiday special, it hangs in the balance. Uh, but in the meantime, I have two guests today who I know you will love. Paul Sanders recorded a, a special episode for an Access All Areas feature we had last year, something you could only hear if you were a patron. In fact, that was our very, very, very first Patreon post. But, uh, but now and then, just now and then, mind, and with permission of our, our wonderful patrons who support us, in a recent conversation, I'm going to be playing you... Uh, we had a conversation on the, the first Tuesday in every month Zoom call, and we, we discussed... Um, uh, or they gave me permission, because, you know, they're producers of the show, you know, you lot. Um, permission to play some of, those, some of those bits that you won't generally hear. So a very special treat today. Uh, just part of my conversation with a photographer who's made mindfulness and photography his complete life. This will be like meditation in your ears, I promise. And back for the second and concluding part of her conversation with me is Sandra Catania Ordorno, who at 60 found photography. And then the publishing world, well, they found her. Today on The Photo Walk. Photography made me look around me, made me see people made me pay attention to interactions, to the eyes of people, to to everything. It, it's a different world that I now have that I didn't, and I would have died without knowing it. My love of black and white, it, it goes all the way back to me starting in photography, and I like the simplicity of it. And I think in some ways, colour for me, when I was going through my real mental health battle, colour was just more noise added to a situation. Paul Sanders back after a year, but this time for all years, as he shares why he shoots the way he does and what mindfulness in photography means. And of course, Sandra Catania Ordono is back for more with her story of the book Aguas de Oro. It's the only photography show like this in the podcast sphere, and you are, as we say each week, very much a part of it. We invite you just to, to walk. Uh, just us with our cameras taking along your letters, your DMs, your Facebook messages. Lots of thoughts, lots of creative insight. And of course, our special guests too also will be hearing from former guests who have their snippets of inspiration. Thomas Heaton is going to talk about, well, I, I'm going to refer to it as his bucket list view. And Chris Floyd on making pictures for the love, not the likes. Oh, and we're going to transport ourselves to Morocco through a sound recording one of our writers made when making pictures. Ah, the power of sound in your pictures. We'll talk more about that soon. I'll tell you also more about what we're talking about from your letters in a moment after we mention our friends at mpb.com who are the number one platform in the UK and the US and Europe with bases in Brighton, Brooklyn and Berlin when it comes to buying, trading or selling your quality use kit online. This month, we've been talking about changing. Changing your kit, understanding how a moment can change the way we feel. MPB.com puts photo and video kit into more hands, more sustainably, helping you to change kit to tell the stories you want to tell with your photography. And they give you affordable access to kit that doesn't have to cost the earth. So sell the kit you're not using, trade it in for some stuff that you think, oh, I need that. Or I really would like that to help me go create. Buy used, spend less and get more. Go to mpb.com, buy, sell, trade and create. We're also supported by our amazing patrons who help glue this show together every single week. Who from the price of one high street coffee per month are each and everyone helping to build this show so that it can continue in its mission to become a, a diverse community of photographers from every interest, every genre and every level of competence helping to guide and support and mentor photographers worldwide. So, on the show today, your letters as we talk about the power of sound, yes, and a particular camera that used to let you record sound files as a kind of, well, audio notepad to go with your pictures. A mention for those who can get to London of a, an Amazonia exhibition featuring, well, you know who. Don't fear, though, the links will be on the show page, so wherever you are in the world, you can appreciate it too. We're talking about the names you give your camera since that started a roll. Uh, we're making photo walking pictures in Houston, musing about a world that was once only in black and white. Well, that's what we used to tell our kids, isn't it? Singing to unsuspecting fishermen, wondering how important the word professional really is, 
and visiting the work of a street photographer who became a checker cab driver in New York to make the most amazing nighttime pictures of those who hailed him down. And if that's not enough, we're looking ahead to a, a very special guest from the world of fashion on next week's show. But right now, we should walk. Coffee and Garibaldi's are packed. Check. Boots definitely laced. Check. Spare batteries, cards and film. Check. Earbuds in. Check. Lens caps off. Let's walk. We're starting this week with a letter from Barnabas Humelik in Slovakia, or as we now say on the show, Slovakia land, following episode 260 where we talked in, in one part of the show about recording audio to go with your photographs, which uh, if we do do this retreat in, in February 2022, probably not in the windmill I'm looking at right now, um, it's going to be one part of our, our journey, funnily enough. Sound, that is, not working in a windmill. Hi, Neil, says Barnabas. First of all, I want to thank you for the time you're investing in the show. You sound like my agent, Barnabas. <laughs> or at least the agent I wish I, I had. I started to listen to the Fujicast podcast months ago, and it took me quite some time to realise there's actually a separate show of yours. This one. I'm now listening to the Photo Walk podcast as well, and I have a lot to catch up with. Both podcasts are very inspiring. Uh, but to demonstrate how inspiring they are, to me at least, let me share with you my recent rediscovery. I am all ears, Barnabas. I was listening to the Photo Walk, episode 260 recently, where you talked about John Baisley's project of adding audio to his photographs and stories. Yes, we did. Was it 260? I thought it was before then. This reminded me of my year I spent in the US back in 97, where I worked as an au pair with a family in Dayton, Ohio. I also took a course of photography there and bought my first serious SLR, uh, the Canon Rebel X. I never... the Rebel X. Because uh, I know in America land, they, they call um, their Canon range different to ours, don't they? Slightly... yeah. What, what's a Rebel in... oh, well, it doesn't matter. You bought a Rebel. That's good enough for us. Oh, this wind's getting up. It won't be long before that, that windmill's actually able to produce some flour. Quick, Neil, get your overalls on. They might need you. In my spare time, says Barnabas, I tried to travel as much as I could in the States. I shot many, many rolls of film as this beautiful hobby had really gotten to me. It was back then when I came up with an idea or project, if you like, to record and add audio to my photos. I used to have a small dictating machine with regular size magnetic tapes. So that will be cassettes, won't it? Do you remember how, um, for those that are of an age that remember buying cassettes to record on, if you had um, magnetic ones, they were twice the price, weren't they? But it was like, oh, you've got magnetic tapes. Cool, you're a proper pro, you are. Yeah, as Barnabas said, I used to record the sounds that surrounded me. I was shooting a lot of slides at the time and I was planning to project the images and play the sounds that I recorded to complete and complement the mood and the ambience at the time of making the pictures. Most of the tapes, sadly, are long gone, most probably, Barnabas says in brackets. I couldn't even think of a place to look for them. But listening to the podcast, I suddenly remembered a few images, few recordings that I had made. The sound, or in brackets, should I, should I say the rambling noise of the Niagara Falls, the horns of steamships on the Mississippi River down in New Orleans, the mighty sound of the Pacific Ocean at Venice Beach outside Los Angeles, the barking of seals in San Francisco. Oh, I can hear it as you're saying it. I remember I continued this when I returned home and went on other travels. I recorded a woman talking to her daughter in a church in Aramaic, the language of Jesus. It was in a small Christian church hidden among the hills somewhere in Syria where people still spoke this ancient language. Oh, fantastic. I remember recording the preach of an imam to a handful of listeners in a mosque in Damascus and the evening prayer spreading from the minarets from all directions of the city. Actually, I've, I have recorded something like that myself. It's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? It's a sound that um, they say it makes uh, grown men weep and I can completely understand why. However, after these trips, says Barnabas, I failed to put the pieces together to keep a list of recordings and match them with the photos. 
to make it into a project. My fault, eventually, I gave up entirely recording sounds. <gasps> no, Barnabas, he says, in slow motion. You can imagine how shocked, in a positive way, I was to hear about John's project on your show with the sounds recorded alongside his photographs. Not just shocked, but happy above all. Happy to have rediscovered something that I used to do all those years ago and to find inspiration in it again. Technology has, of course, advanced since. It's so easy to record sounds now and to save them along with the images. But uh, now that I'm typing this, I, I remember my first digital camera, Fujifilm FinePix S602 Zoom, that allowed me, get this, to record sounds as well. Only sounds, as a matter of fact, and they were saved as .wav .wav files, so good quality uh, sound files on the card. Isn't that a great feature that modern digital cameras should have as well? You bet they should. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for sharing this story with us and with me. It's re-inspired me. Let's see uh, where I get with the, the new old project this time. All the best from Slovakia. I'll rename it Slovakia Land from Barnabas. There is actually a PS. I'm attaching a .wav file from the camera along with some matching photos taken in uh, Morocco the evening stroke night market of Marrakesh's main square back in 2003. The sound is uh, capturing a snake charmer, entertaining people standing around him. He chose a young boy from the audience. Poor lad, he puts in brackets. He was probably scared to death while the others had great fun. Yes, going by your photographs, that certainly looks like it. So, look, I want to play you just 20 seconds or so of the sound captured. And if you can, if you're not driving, this is important, just stop for a moment. I want you to, to close your eyes and let the, the busy market envelop your ears that Barnabas recorded all those years ago. And you will, you'll hear this little lad um, who you can see his pictures on the show page today, which is linked to in your app. Um, you will hear the, sort of the refusals, I think, as the snake charmer tries to hand the child this snake or at least take the child closer than he feels comfortable with. And you'll hear him shout, nah! Um, I think, I imagine that's the boy, it has to be. Um, the boy is okay, <laughs> by the way, at the end. And the crowd, I would imagine, that they obviously disperse. But uh, Barnabas has both the still images and the sound to take him, and actually us, today, back to that moment. What a wonderful thing to be able to capture. Sound to go with the photographs that you make. Because not everybody wants to make video films, so let's hear that moment from Marrakesh back in 2003. It's the Friday photo walk. Me with my, my camera, you with your camera. Me with my uh, microphone, your letters, your inspirations. I had to move away from the windmill because it was, it was very windy. Well, hence really, Neil, why they put a windmill there because it was on the top of a hill, so there was no protection for the microphone. All, all you'd, you'd have heard for the rest of the photo walk, had I continued the walk, would have been... You know that noise I make every time I try to describe... The, the sound of, uh, of the wind to you. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've come away from the, the windmill into the countryside. Actually, I'm walking along a part of the... I've not walked upon this. I walked along this part before, the Kennet and Avon Canal, which uh, uh, those who listen frequently will know is my, um, is my local canal waterway, which I love to walk along. So uh, it, it provides a bit of shelter from the wind so I can carry on reading your, your letters. I want to mention an event, actually, that's in, uh, that's in full swing at the moment, which I must go and visit. It's um, Salgado at the, the Science Museum in London until March next year, uh, which thank you to one of our patrons, Peter Foote, uh, I now know about. Not quite sure how that uh, escaped my notice, actually, Peter. But, uh, but it did. Uh, and this looks amazing. It, um, it's an enormous exhibition called Amazonia, which, as you can imagine, is all about uh, the planet and the relationship um, the Amazon and its peoples have with it. 
and, and mentioning sound as we did a moment ago with Barnabas, actually this one, the whole exhibition, is set to an immersive landscape and tapestry of sound that was designed by none other than Jean-Michel Jarre, described here in this blurb as the 1970s New Age pioneer. Lelia Salgado's wife actually curated this, and the, and the music is described itself as politely ambient, but with elemental roars, bird calls, forest sounds, and human voices. You will believe you are there, and I can't wait to see it. It sounds fantastic. Now, this one is right up my alley, as they would say, because of the, the sound and, obviously, Salgado's pictures. I can, um, I can picture it, actually, being in the, in the exhibition, listening to the sound of, of what you're looking at. Um, oh, fantastic. Uh, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, and I know there'll be some people in, um, in parts of the world saying, hang on, Neil, we don't live there. That's a bit unfair. I'll leave a link to it so that you can read all about it. There are some fantastic pieces written about it. So there we go. You, you'll be able to see it from afar. So let's do some mails from you, from the, the mail bag. Do you remember we were talking about names for cameras? Uh, seems a few of you actually do this. Jason Pink. Camera names, Neil. Well, of all the people, I thought you would give your camera a voice and give it a name. Though I guess if uh, form is to be observed, you'd simply call it camera. The same way that you call your car, car. I call my Nikon D750, Mabel. She didn't start out as Mabel, it's just that as the years have gone by, she's earned the name my grandfather called my grandmother, Mabel. Mabel was actually Mary, but that's another story altogether. Suffice to say, Mabel was the rock of our family. And so I thought it fitting that a camera that's taken me through so many adventures and is still ticking over should be called Mabel. And then uh, Eric with a K. Hi, Neil. Oh, Eric, where would we be without you? Once upon a time, you know, it was, uh, it was Hegard the Dane. We haven't heard from Hegard the Dane for ages. Have we upset you, Hegard? Uh, Eric with a K, I'm sat here listening to you while editing last year's portfolio to look for keepers before putting in new images for this year's portfolio. Oh, I love that job. I haven't done that for a while, actually. I don't know why I haven't done that um, for a while. I've not really been... Um, I, think, I think the pandemic kind of slowed me down on stuff like that. You've just given me the shove that I need. We have to, uh, to hand one in to our photo club each year. And then this airs out, giving your camera a name. I never thought of naming my camera, but I do think my X-T3 is a banger of a camera. And with the show a few weeks ago in mind, talking about the head-butting character from Boys and the Black stuff, the banger of a camera is now called Yozza. Ah, uh, you will need to listen back if you haven't heard those episodes to understand the context on that one. And then just when you thought it was all over, Stuart Gray, I don't name any of my new cameras, Neil, but the more mature film ones have earned an endearing title each. Old Gray is my Leica M6, for example. Now, Stuart, yes, of course, it has the, uh, the silver top, doesn't it? The, uh, well, all, all the Leicas, well, not all the Leicas, you get black ones as well, don't you? But the, the, silver, the silver top of a Leica M6. But it turned out, actually, I, I did go do some research. There was a special, special, special platinum edition with, uh, with grey or, well, it looks like silver casing, lower half too. Proper collector's item. I'm wondering if that's the one you have. Maybe. So, uh, so thank you. Yes, it turns out more photographers name their cameras than we otherwise thought. We're all a tad eccentric, aren't we? Us photography people. Helps us maybe cope with the world around us. I don't know. What was that very, um, what was that very un-PC phrase that you used to see in offices? I think maybe, uh, do you remember Athena posters? Athena posters, Neil? How old are you? Athena posters, you remember those, surely? I think, uh, I think somebody like, oh, somebody like that had a poster that said, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps. And a few of the offices I have worked in, although granted I've not worked in many, in my pro working life, had, uh, had, had that poster, or certainly those words. Right, timely moment for some ins. Oh, by the way, if you do call your camera a name, let me know. Write to me, studio at photographydaily.show. Yeah, it's, it's, good to, it's good to catch up with your eccentricities out there. Right, timely moment for some inspiration. Let me, uh, let me take you back to, uh, to my chat in episode 71 with Thomas Heaton 
when I uh, when I asked him to tell me uh, to tell me or describe a scene that he hadn't yet photographed that was in his photographic bucket list, as it were. And what might that be? Although I don't think he quite understood to start with what I was asking for. Do you know what? I just don't get lucky with fog and mist. Uh, it's what I seek the most, and I've it's just so rare for me to find it I have a couple of images that are nice foggy misty days but if I could have if I had one magical power to be able to switch on any kind of weather anything <laughs> it would be the mist switch and I just can't find it I see photographers out there and all they're doing is putting out images of mist <laughs> and I'm the, where is this mist it's never there and when it's forecast it's always wrong so that's uh, that's that's where I would love but that's the thing. That's the thing that you would like. But what, what's the what's the scene that you would like in in that mist or without the mist? Oh, the scene. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I I would like to improve my woodland photography. Oh, right. uh, active volcanoes oh, and yes. icebergs. Yes. Um, uh. Yeah, for sure. Ice, icebergs and active volcanoes. If I can get them in one scene, then well, I'll have just won the lottery. So. With, with the mist switch, obviously. <laughs> Oh, with a bit of mist. With a yeah, bit of mist. Nice. I'd, so, I'd say, uh, I, yeah, wow, good question. I mean, I've, I'm pretty lucky, actually. This just goes to show how much I am living the dream because I've pretty much photographed every scene you yeah. can think of. Thomas Heaton waiting for a volcano, an iceberg, all in one shot. Do you think he might be waiting a while? <laughs> Maybe. Right, quick mention for the uh, 365s. You have been absolutely brilliant in sending them in. Thank you, thank you, and thank you once more for doing so. Um, we, uh, we set the community 365 up to be the, uh, to be the, the daily, really, and photography daily. And uh, it gives those of you who've always thought, oh, I'd like to have a go at a 365, a chance to, a chance to be part of one without having the, the stress, the anxiety of thinking that you have to post one every single day. We all, um, we, we all, sh- we all share um, in, in the opportunity to, to post. And uh, you can post many times. I mean, I've, I've had some, some of you wonderfully send in um, two, three, four more, actually, photographs that, that will be published in the year to come. I have a feeling at some stage... It, it might be that we start to see some, possibly some diptychs or something like that when, when we've got lots more so that uh, everybody gets a, a fair bite and you don't have to wait too long to see your picture come up on the 365. But thank you. Uh, if you'd like to send yours in, it's nice to get a bit of context. You don't have to give us a, a long essay about it. It's not a photo essay, although we do have a photo essays section, he says, hint, hint. But just a few words about it. Where it was taken is really important, as Lynn Fraser, one of our patrons, suggested a couple of weeks back. That's a nice idea. And, um, and then we, we post them up, simple as. You can see them on the show page, or on the, not the show page, sorry, you can see them on the website under the, uh, the menu item, Community 365. So send them into studio at photographydaily.show. 2,000 pixels, this is really important. 2,000 pixels on the wide side, or on the long side, not necessarily wide. And also, non-watermarked for these ones. Otherwise, the gallery starts to look, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't look quite like we'd planned anyway. We will, of course, um, uh, give links to your, your Instagram or your website or Flickr, um, 500px, whatever you're on, we'll, uh, we'll link to. And remember, whenever you send an email in, do tell me every single time what your link is, because it's sometimes difficult to, to track back and, oh, where was that link? What was the link I needed to put up? So do tell me every time. I won't be offended if you say, Neil, I need to remind you of this. Please do. Um, oh, I'm also keen to hear about what you're doing photographically, even if you don't send a picture into any of these features, because that is really what we love to read on these photo walks that we make of a, of a Friday. I've got a feeling they're going to be windy, but it just feels like the, the, the winter winds have arrived. You can hear them, can't you? Look, look at that, right on cue. Which, um, I mean, I quite like a windy walk, but... Uh, it's much harder to record in, so usually in the winter time you find me hidden in some forestry or woodland or something um, because I need to sort of shelter from the wind for, the, for recording's sake. But it does also mean you don't hear so many birds. Cue birds. No, none of you, not one, oh, one of you. 
just up there. But I can't really hear you. Yes, you don't hear them so much in the winter, do you, as you, you do in the summertime. But, uh, right, where were we? Let's talk about uh, where you've been walking while listening to the show. Richard Yarp, we'll start with you. I was out last Friday for a photo walk in downtown Houston looking for some architecture or other fun subjects. We live about 35 miles north, so I have to have an occasion to go. Fortunately, one presented itself for Friday and I could carve out some time for a photo walk. I was looking for some additional variety from what I usually see around my own area. Architecture and abstract architecture, or architecture photography at that, is a fascination, so I always jump at an opportunity to practice. All photos taken with an X-T3 and a 16-55, to and a couple with a new 70-300 to as well. Oh, you've got that, good. Um, well, you can see the pictures on the show page today. There are four that I've chosen, in particular, of Richard's. All bar one involve reflections. I'm a bit of a sucker for reflections. And there is a, a superb vanishing point image as well. Perfectly abstract. Love them. Wonderful. My brother-in-law actually reminded me the other day that he lives in a brutalist building in London which was built around the time the, uh, the famous Barbican, which is a very famous brutalist building in terms of architecture, uh, w was built... And if you don't know what brutalism is, we're not back talking about the way Yosa Hughes treated his, his head in Boys and, Boys and the Black stuff. We're talking about grey, blocky, seriously sometimes, well, can I say depressing, but, but in, a, in an architectural sense, depressing doesn't always mean bad. That sounds odd, Neil. I realise that. Not very good at describing that, but... I'm hoping you know what I mean, but we're talking about these sort of grey, blocky, concrete art dressed up as buildings that were the, the theatre or where you lived. Brutalist architecture is, is a, an architectural style which, um, which emerged in the 50s. Am I right in saying the 50s? Yes. I mean, look up the Barbican. Actually, I tell you what, better still, I'll leave a link in the show notes to brutalist buildings. But... Um, but in terms of abstract architectural photography, Richard, you would absolutely love it in the UK. There's, and there's my brother-in-law actually living in it. See? Mini, mini projects in your life that you didn't even consider until they were pointed out to you brutally. Right. Let's, uh, we're, we're going to escape brutalism, certainly escape it. I mean, this is chalk and cheese, really with uh, this next feature. Let, let me introduce you to my first guest this week, chapter one of our guests, Paul Sanders. Now, every now and then, we've decided to release some um, uh, parts of some episodes and, and diary pieces. Oh, there goes the early train to London. Oh no, it's better than that, it's a long freight train. Oh, my youngest is gonna say, Dad! If he listens back to this, why didn't you get that picture? Don't tell him. Only you and I heard. Although he does listen to the podcast sometimes. So yes, every now and then, we've decided to release parts of some episodes and diary pieces that up to now only patrons have heard. Um, so that you can hear what's going on and if you want to support the show, you might think, ah, oh, that's fab. I'd like to be a part of that. And this is one of those moments, just so you can hear what supporters of the show get to hear. Um, we did play out um, an interview with Paul, and then we had some extra stuff, and this is one of those extras. Uh, so some context about Paul Sanders. You'd be forgiven for thinking that, um, that working as he did as a Reuters and Times photographer would surely be, a, be enough for most um, professionals behind the lens. I mean, the, these are the recognised powerhouses in news and journalism and photojournalism but then if you're driven like Paul was you're bound by a different set of rules and one rule set constantly asks what next what next what next which for Paul as a photographer meant that he wanted to work the desk not just work the desk but be in charge of the pictures desk at the uh, the times becoming picture editor I mean, there's an opportunity that uh, only a favoured few will have in a lifetime. But um, it comes with a, a great deal of stress and anxiety. And for Paul, that led to a mental breakdown. And for a moment, he literally stood upon the top of Beachy Head 
which is the, the unfortunate spot more than 500 people have chosen as their last. 152 metres high is that cliff. Beachy Head has a, a very, very dark history for such a beautiful place. But for Paul, someone reached out that day that he was there and uh, his life changed for, for the better and for the quieter. And he now runs Discovery Still, mindful photography workshops that offer an opportunity to, to step away from the everyday and to discover a different perspective, a chance to pause and to connect with the world around you and use photography as a means to explore how you feel in that moment. So here's my chat, sir, or part of my chat with Paul, the tail end of, uh, of our discussion, where we talked about his most oh, fantastic, beautiful, calm photographs of, of the ocean, rivers in the mist, even flora, beautiful wildlife at times. Life has certainly changed for Paul Sanders. Your pictures are very minimalist. Um, how long do you take to find and, and make a composition? I'm, I'm assuming you, you're no longer driving around in quite that, maybe I'm using a clumsy expression here, but crazed manner that you once were. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, I now only photograph in, um, let's say, far away locations or drive to locations. When I'm doing workshops or talks nearby, most of the stuff I shoot now is is very close to home. Sometimes in the garden we're very lucky that we live out in the countryside um i've got some woods opposite the house which i love and we're 40 minutes from the kent coast so occasionally i'll wander down there or down to the sussex coast um but i don't you know i don't need to drive anywhere i i now fully appreciate beauty is actually everywhere you know you don't need to travel to a well photographed location to take a, a, a picture that works for you you know, I'd taken my home area for granted for so long. Thing, you know, a bit like you live in London, you never go and visit anything in London. <laughs> um, it's only when you move out of London, you then go and visit everything in London because all of a sudden it's not on your doorstep. I, I would deliberately ignore Kent a lot of the time, but I'm so lucky to live here. Yeah, we don't have mountains and massive waterfalls, but it's a different kind of beauty. And I think when you start as a photographer you tend to put too much into your pictures you overdo the information and i just started simplifying and simplifying and simplifying because my head was complicated enough it was noisy enough um there was so much going on i was so distracted by everything that the simpler my pictures the more i could understand what was coming out that just started to work as um almost as a style but it i, I had to be very careful because you know, people put you in boxes very quickly, you know, so people will always say, oh, you, do, you just do long exposure um, or you just do landscape. Uh, and I'm not one thing or another. I'm just a photographer. I'm happy behind the lens with a person in front of me of interest. And it has to be an interesting person, not just a random person, but an interesting person, whether it's a building or a landscape or the sea or a lake or a tree or a gate or a flower, um, you know, I mean, last week I was photographing the scraps of paper that came off my book, um, you know, when, when we trimmed it. Um, <laughs> and it, it's just being able to look at something and go, do you know what, I really like that. And that's where my photography is. It's, I really like that. You know, I think that whatever that is, is beautiful or interesting to me. I don't give two hoots, really. And not in an arrogant way as to where other people like what I shoot or not and you know it does sound a bit arrogant when you say I don't care what people think but I don't but it's not through arrogance it's through self-concern self-healing if you like because the only person that my pictures have to please is me yeah. um, and that's where often we lose sight because we're always thinking you know if you're in a camera club oh I hope the judge likes it or I hope the other members like it yeah. you know yeah. If you're doing qualification, then the, the committee's got to like it. Um, if it's going in for an exhibition, you want other people to like it. You know, you're putting it on Facebook or Instagram. It's, it's nice to get that validation. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I've got a, a lovely group of followers on Instagram and Facebook and, uh, you know, of my newsletter and things like that. Um, and they're really supportive. But if I had no people following me on any social media, I would still take the same photographs that I do. 
um, because they're important to me and I enjoy the moment that I'm taking them. So every, every stage of my kind of development into whatever photographer people want to say I am is basically a journey of self-discovery and self-expression. That sort of sums it up, really. I don't know whether that's the answer you were looking no, for. No, I, I, well, I think if you start to wear other people's opinions as well, you're, you're straight back to square one as, as well, Paul, aren't you, really? And I think you've made the right decision in that respect. It, it's nice to have your work liked, but if you don't like it, if you're not shooting true to yourself, you might get people saying your work is, is nice, um, you know, that they like it, but it will always feel a bit empty to you. Yeah. People talk a lot about getting it right in camera, but your approach isn't just simply a, an exposure exercise or long exposure exercise, as you've, you've now identified as well. You use filters and, and an array of those to achieve your signature look. Can you take me through that yeah. process? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole getting it right in camera thing, I like to get it as close to right as I can. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to not do anything in Lightroom or Photoshop. So... I don't want people thinking I'm some kind of amazingly gifted photographer that can turn sow's ears into silk purses <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> using a film simulation. It doesn't quite work like that. But what I do is I, I mean, for the long exposures, I, I use Lee neutral density filters and I've got everything in my bag from a two stop up to a 15 stop. And I will combine those um, in whatever sandwich is necessary and i also use graduated filters a lot now i i could do it in lightroom i'm sure but i like producing as close to the effect i want in camera and then using lightroom and photoshop to enhance rather than using lightroom and photoshop to make the picture i'm assuming as well these are drop-in filters rather than screw-on yeah. filters yeah i am not a fan of the the screw-on filter because they they limit the creativity that you can have a slide-in filter you know you can put it anywhere and angle it at any point yes. um you know so it's your decision rather than the manufacturer's decision as to where the grad falls which is why i've always supported lee i think their filters are great um i like the team at lee filters they've always been very supportive of my work and they're british made which is very important mm. to me um but the whole idea of it is that i use those filters to create something in the viewfinder that reflects how i'm feeling about what the landscape is saying to me and that's the important thing, so that when I get back, I can look at the file and go, right, this is where I was going. And all I need to do now is add a bit of contrast or, you know, lessen the contrast off or just bring the blacks down a tiny bit. Because I don't want to spend a lot of time behind my computer, you know, which is odd at the moment, seeing as I spent more time behind my computer now in a day than I used to when I was at the Times. Um, but for me, the joy of photography is being outside with the wind in my face and the rain kind of bashing on my waterproofs and you know, that experience, the the experience of photography for me isn't sitting behind my computer. For some people, the experience of photography is the computer bit. So the, there's no there's no wrong or right. Um, it's just what suits you. And I think whatever suits you, go with. I don't think, you know, getting it right in camera should be held up as a sort of a benchmark, just as I think, you know, shooting without any filters or um, exposure control should be held up as a benchmark. I, I think every person has an individual approach that works for them. And if you try to do it in the way that other people do, you won't be happy. You've got to find your own mm -hmm. your own way of doing it. And my way of doing it is I get it close as close to right as I can, and then I tweak it. Um, I don't shoot to the right and get as much information as I can on the sensor because that's not the way I work. I just let it sit where it sits. You know, so often my files are very much stacked towards the black end, which means I've got very little information to work with. So therefore, I don't work the files too hard. But if I'm teaching photography, I will always teach people that the more information they get on the sensor, the better image they will get. Because I don't want to just make people clones of me. I want them to be able to work out what they want and then throw the stuff away that is irrelevant to them. You know, and I think that's a very important thing that when you're helping people with their photography, you don't turn them into you. You know, as I found, Joe Cornish is the best Joe Cornish on the market. Yes. Um, you know, and I know Joe often says that people do Joe Cornish better than he does. There are there are people out there who take who go to locations that I've photographed and photograph them in a similar style to me, but photograph them in a much better way. But I never look at them and think, oh, I wish I'd done it like that. Because I did it the way I did it at a certain moment 
based on how I was feeling in a certain set of weather conditions that will never be repeated. I don't worry about it. I will show people exactly where I went and exactly how I shot if that's what they really want. That standing in the rain thing that you talk about, there's a, uh, yeah. um, a lot of the images look like they're taken through mist and, and that is because of this long exposure. And, and, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you just go looking for the mist, but maybe you do. Yeah, yeah. But but photographing through the rain obviously can, can create that sort of image as well, can't it? Yes, it, it does. Um, you know, especially if it's heavy rain and you're shooting into the light a little bit, you, you do get a slightly misty, softer look. I like that. Um, I love working with the rain, you know, so you, you're shooting through the rain, but I always try and make sure the rain's at my back so it's not blowing onto the lens or, you know, I've got a big umbrella, um, I've got good waterproofs. I love being out in the rain. I think it's really exciting. I think yeah. photography can, well, it is a very solitary occupation. These yeah. beautiful images that you create, they, they can make me this in a good way i want you to understand this but make me feel quite alone in the places that you show like i'm tr- <laughs> truly stuck in a moment uh, and I, I know that's partly how landscape works you kind of teleport somebody into the scene but you also especially so because they're completely serene and that has to be purposeful yeah i i rarely rarely like my landscapes to have people in i like to feel like i'm the only person there that I'm the only person experiencing that moment. And I, I believe that when you're really connected to the landscape, the moment of beauty is just for you. Even if there are other photographers around, they'll be at a slightly different angle, so they'll see it differently. Um, their moment will be different. So, you know, I purposefully don't really like people in my pictures. I've included them a couple of times for scale, but I've ne- it's never really never really done it for me um so i like the landscape to be just the landscape just how it is and allow people who are viewing the pictures the freedom to interpret it in their own ways you know so their own sense of scale or you know questioning of of scale and i want you know like you said i want people to feel that when they look at the pictures they're the only people looking at them um you know or in them i think viewing photographs should be as immersive in some ways as as the taking and I, I think you only get that when you stand in front of a, a, a print or you hold a print. Well, I want I want to come to the tactile nature of the print element of your work in a second, but I yeah. can't believe it's taken this long to to ask you this question through this interview. But um, why black and white? Why not colour? Colour irritates me. I find colour distracting. I liken it to having my arm rubbed with a cheese grater. <laughs> my goodness. Um, <laughs> I look at colour pictures and I can really appreciate their beauty, but... When I look at a landscape, I don't see the colour. I see tone, I see texture, you know, I see pattern, I see rhythm, I see lines. I don't see the colours. It just doesn't do it for me. Mm. I've always had a fascination with black and white. I mean, I started, you know, my first photographs were on black and white film. Um, I worked in a black and white dark room. My love of black and white, it, it goes all the way back to me starting in photography. And I like the simplicity of it. And I think in some ways... Colour, for me, when I was going through my real mental health battle, colour was just more noise added to a situation. Um, It was more distraction. And I like the strength in black and white, but I like the subtlety. I like how clean it can be. And I sometimes find with colour that people just jack the colours up to make a picture look good. And, you know, if you listen to people and they say the reaction to the picture is, God, the colours are amazing. That's not the photograph is brilliant. That's the colours are amazing. Mm. I think when people look at the colour over the content, that's really sad. And there are some amazing people who do colour photography. You know, their work is is mind blowing. But I just don't see that way. I, I see the world in shades of grey, often shades of dark grey, um, or shades of you know tones of white. I use the colour. This is the odd bit. I, uh, although I shoot black and white and colour, I, I sh- you know, I'm quite old-fashioned because I shoot JPEGs in black and white, and my raw files are obviously they come out colour. But I use the colour to allow me to express the tones in a picture. So, like, I'll often shoot with a the red filter on to increase the intensity of of blues, or I'll alter it round to change the way a, a picture will will look because. I I think, you know, in the old days, we used to use filters on black and white film because black and white film saw colour. Yes. And, you know, so there's nothing wrong with using the colour information to produce the best black and white file that I can produce. 
And I, I think a lot of people forget that black and white actually is a is, is a response to colour. So it's just a different way of seeing colour. You see it as tones mm. rather than colours. Paul Sanders with his reasons behind his glorious, and they are black and white photographs of uh, calm. And I urge patrons to go right back to our first Patreon post to hear that wonderful show in full. Talking of patrons, here's a, a, a mention for patron of the day, Peter Turnbull from Brizzy. Brizzy, in dear old Australia land. And because we don't just throw this together, you know, this is a mail Peter sent in a month and a bit back uh, that's been waiting for the, the perfect opportunity. And uh, what with Paul talking about black and white, um, uh, th uh, this is that moment. <laughs> Hello, Neil. Just catching up on back episodes and heard you talking about how you told your boys the world used to be in black and white. It reminded me of the, um, of the attached Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Not sure you're aware of Calvin and Hobbes, but this particular cartoon strip makes me laugh every time I see it. Cruel but funny. Uh, there's a second part, actually, to this letter. But uh, let's talk about Calvin and Hobbes, first of all, this cartoon, which is exactly the kind, the kind of conversation I have with my kids. But uh, Calvin and Hobbes, I did have to look it up, is uh, was a daily American comic strip created by the cartoonist Bill Watterson that was uh, syndicated from, here we go, November 18th, 1985 to December 31st, 1995. What would we do without Wiki, huh? Commonly cited as the last great newspaper comic, Calvin and Hobbes has enjoyed broad and enduring popularity, influence and academic and philosophical interest. Actually, scholars, uh, it seems, have written about this strip or, 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 or taken particular strips and, and made full studies on them. So Calvin, of the Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin is this adventurous six-year-old boy and Hobbes is uh, his stuffed tiger that has an imaginary voice. Who would do something like that, huh? And this particular strip was all... This one that, that uh, was sent in by Peter was all about uh, a conversation uh, Dad was having with Calvin, his son. And it, uh, it goes along these lines. I can't read it entirely to you, of course. Uh, but uh, it goes along these lines. Dad, how come old photographs are always black and white? Didn't they have colour film back then? Ah, sure they did, son. In fact, those old photographs are in colour. It's just the world was in black and white. See, this is what I used to say to the kids. Really? Yeah. Mm. The world didn't turn colour till sometime in the 30s. And it was pretty grainy colour for a, a while as well. Whoa, that's really weird, Dad. Yeah. But then, why are old paintings in colour if the world was black and white? Wouldn't artists have painted it that way? I oh, see, that's a very good retort from Calvin, isn't it? Oh, not necessarily, son. A lot of great artists were insane. Huh? But, but how could they have painted in colour anyway? Wouldn't their paints have been shades of grey? Yeah, but of course they turned colour like everything else did in the 30s. Oh, so why didn't old black and white photos turn colour as well? Great question. How's Dad going to come back from that? Uh, because they were colour pictures of black and white, remember? Very quick, Dad. Very quick. I'm not sure I'd have been as quick when I was talking to my kids, but I do remember. I think the, the very, very last time we were able to, <laughs> to, say, to say that to the kids, we were just... Uh, I know, where were we? We'd, we were just approaching the seaside. It could have even been the Isle of Wight, you know. And we were driving over the brow of a hill. No, it was Cornwall. I remember now, it was Cornwall. Driving over the brow of a hill. And, uh, and I saw the sea, and we did that thing with the kids, you know. I can see the sea. Who was the first to see it? I was. No, you weren't. I was, punch. Anyway, so we did that thing, and, and I remember saying to them, kids, you are so lucky. That sea's blue. In, when Daddy was growing up, everything, everything was black and white. No way. Yes, it was. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the Calvin and Hobbes uh, comic strip there. That certainly made me chuckle. Anyway, Peter says, I was also interested in the... Uh, oh, hang on. I want to try and get to a... I'm digressing. I'm good at that. Oh, my boots are so caked in mud. Car is going to be absolutely... 
totally filthy angry with me. Hope you remembered your shoes. And I told you, I'm, t I'm taking spare shoes out these days. Don't worry, car. Ooh, I know, I am caked in mud. Anyway, I'm trying to get, I want to get across. I'm not going to walk across this field. I'll make, I'll make car even angrier. It's just, oh, it's been ploughed as well. You shouldn't really walk across a ploughed field, should you? But I want to get to, looks like a disused bridge. I always think disused bridges are really interesting to photograph. Anyway, sorry, Peter, I'm digressing. Peter says, um, I was also in, in the, uh, interested in the debate about, um, about professional photographers and what this means, if it means anything at all, really. It's funny how we don't talk about, Peter says, professional plumbers, and professional carpenters, professional carpet layers or, or any other trade. Yes, they're trained and serve an apprenticeship sometimes, but um, so do many, if not all, photographers in a sense. It may not always be a recognised qualification, but they work just as hard. And of course, uh, there are duds in every profession, be it accounting, medical, law, etc., just as there are in photography. Calling yourself a professional means nothing. I take photos as part of my job. I also shoot for a small number of clients and I shoot for fun, but I don't use the tag professional and never would. I believe, says Peter, anybody who takes time to compose, light, shoot and edit an image is a photographer, whether they sell their work or not. Just my two cents worth. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Peter Turnbull in Brisbane, Australia land. Yes, yes, Peter, and yes. Although I, I did look at my business card uh, when I originally read your mail, I thought, what have I written on my... I haven't used a business card for so long. Who uses business cards these days? I do, Neil. Oh, do you? Okay, sorry. Um, but I, yes, I did look at my business card and found the words professional photographer in the middle. I wonder, Peter, do, do you think I wasted some ink? Maybe. Anyways, talking of, um, talking of a photographer, I'll try and get across to that bridge for one of the final links today one of our fun one of one of our final patters i'll try and get across anyways while i'm doing that talking of a photographer who probably doesn't need to ever boast the word professional here is chris floyd filmmaker photographer well respected on the editorial scene here he is talking about just being a photographer from an early age and uh, you know what I suspect he probably still feels this way. You know, I started doing photography when I was about 14, and it was a, it was a hobby. For the first, I don't know, six, seven years, it was, my, it was just a hobby I did after school and at weekends and stuff. And you have to remember that for that, that period of time, the only reason you did it was because you just wanted to do it. You weren't doing it for money, and you weren't doing it for glory or fame or anything like that. You were just doing it because you liked the smell of the chemicals in the darkroom and you liked the way a print appeared when you started knocking a piece of paper around in a tray of developer. And you liked all those things, and you have to remember that's why you, the thing that you loved about it in the first place. And then you have to apply that to the way you go about your work on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis at the age we're at now, which is to be enthusiastic. And also, uh, you want people, because I photograph people, I want people to leave my company at the end of the day and think that was a really great day um, that, that's in the positive column of my, of my time on earth I'd really like to spend time with him again Chris Floyd and I'll, I'll link to uh, Chris's work on the, the show page today well, this is interesting I'm, at, uh, I'm on bridge 99 along the, the Kennet and, the, and Avon Canal and I, uh, I noticed that this, uh, this bridge unlike a lot of well, all the other bridges is at an angle um, and uh, sure enough, it says here, there's a, there's a visitor's sign here. Uh, it says it's uh, one of the, uh, the first skew bridges designed by a, an engineer called John Rennie. Uh, it's a wonderful spot for watching colourful canal boats and excursion steam trains on the west of England main line. Yes, it's right next to the main line, which is why you heard the train earlier on. The long freight train. The picture that I missed for my son. I'll be in trouble. Sorry, Thomas. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and also here, I, when I got on top of the bridge, they've, um, it, was, uh, it was ragtag and rumble and in 1981 it looked like it was fit to fall, but um, they've, uh, they've done some work on it, some brickwork. Uh, but along the top there's these, uh, these 
these defences right in the middle of the bridge that were built to, to stop tanks crossing it uh, if, if the country had been invaded. You see that often along bridges, that the bridges have an anti-tank um, fixtures. Let me get a picture so you can see what I mean. Uh, got a wide angle on, got my Samyang 24mm on the uh, X-Pro1 using, um, using manual focusing with uh, focus peaking on red. It's quite a dark day, but I, as I said before, I, I like my moody cloud. So what I tend to do is I underexpose all my pictures so that I can, uh, I can really accentuate the, the clouds. So one, two, fifth, ISO 400. Uh, let's, let's try F8, here we go. Yes. Really strange, they've become part of the history of the bridge. These huge, well, they're like concrete pins that make it entirely impossible to... Well, I suppose you, you'd have been able to get a tractor through to work on the land, but um, nothing much larger. Right, we are going to Brazil in a moment. Um, I can't say that country name without thinking of the Terry Gilliam film, and I'm surprised I got through last week's programme without doing that. But I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm on my Todd, on my own, in the countryside, and I felt I could, I could let out a good Brazil. Do you remember the Terry Gilliam film? No, Neil? What was the Terry Gilliam film, Brazil? I'll tell you. It was a dystopian, there's a nice word, dystopian 1985 film. Uh, it was a, I suppose you could call it a cult science fiction that, um, well, <laughs> it only really makes sense if I've had half a vat of Chateau Neuf to fall over. It really does. I, I, you know, if you watch this thing in an entirely sober state, I'm probably saying the wrong thing altogether here. I appreciate that. It doesn't seem to make as much sense. Uh, but anyway, we're talking about Brazil. I'm getting lost in the Terry Gilliam Brazil film, which is fantastic. You have to go add it to your must-watch list if you haven't already seen it, that is. So uh, we're back for part two of my chat with the wonderful Sandra Catania Odorno from Brazil in a moment. Oh, there's a fisherman up there. <laughs> he, he looked round. Careful, Neil. Right, a couple of photo walk mails first. Craig Lohman. Hello, Neil. I've uh, only just joined you on your photo walk, and since you mention him, you're now firmly in my must-listen back list along with uh, Joe Rogan. Oh yes, we talked about Joe. Oh, it was weeks ago, wasn't it? Though usually you're served up as the evening come down. Hope you're not offended by that. I'm the come down to Joe Rogan. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure I like that, but I'll go with it. But to be fair, yeah. I mean, if you put me in the same list as the man Spotify paid 100 million to come on board, yes, I should feel honored. Uh, although a lot poorer financially speaking than Joe, clearly. Craig says, it's taken me a while to get used to your strange, quirky Brit ways. But, um, but once I'd figured what a Garibaldi was and the fact you feel comfortable having a conversation with your car, I, I felt I'd found a new friend. Oh, that's nice, if that's how you feel, honestly. I'm not one for posting pictures. It's a hobby that joins me up front as I drive cabs in the Bay Area. One day, one day, I'll start that project I've always dreamed of, photographing those who join me in the back of the cab. Uh, all the best from Craig. Now, you reminded me uh, instantly of uh, the fantastic story, um, though I had to remind myself of his name, the story of, um, of street photographer Ryan... I think, is it Wiedemann or Wiedemann? Wiedemann? Wiedemann. Oh, sorry. I, li I, like to, uh, I like to pride myself that I get names right. Um, but anyway, he drove a New York City cab for decades, um, well, from 1980 anyway, uh, with one eye on the road and a camera in his hand, every passenger became a story, every trip a wild ride. So you see these pictures of the, um, of the wild characters of, of New York City. Even uh, I saw one picture where the, the people in the back, so he would literally turn around and use... Um, uh, use, I think, very rudimentary cameras, actually. I mean, it was a bang, click, flash, tsh, you know, rabbit in headlights shot some of these. Um, or, and, and, and there was one particular picture of, uh, of, uh, of a couple that had... Um, I think it was a couple. Anyway, they had a snake, and they were, they were riding the back of Ryan's 
cab with this <laughs> this snake just weaving around their arms and bodies. Uh, very strange. Um, but amazing pictures to go and look at. And it's a fantastical story, it really is. And Craig, when you said photographing people in the back of a cab, um, it was that story. I know, I think other people have done it as well, but it was that particular story that, that I remember. I've, um, I've left a must-watch short film on the show page, and I've, uh, I've linked to a, a brilliant piece as well from Huck, online where you can read all about uh, uh, Ryan, uh, about Ryan and I, I'm not sure Craig if you if you know of Ryan and maybe I don't know maybe that's what's inspired you to think about your your project but uh, go have a look it's amazing stuff and I, I like to think I learn as much as you when I need to go off and and run some research and it really was I spent a good half hour probably hour actually on one of those rabbit holes uh, finding lots of different things through Google and YouTube Right, last mail of the week time. I'm aware we used to sing the last mail of the week time, but I feel I've done that, really. I mean, I've, I've crossed that bridge quite literally a moment ago, funnily enough, um, by, by singing Brazil twice, loudly, unnecessarily. So I'll, I'll save you the last mail of the week song from Andy Tibolt. Neil, is photography supposed to be dangerous? <laughs> now, there's a question to start a mail with. I mean, if we're talking conflict, Andy, yes, probably it is. And if we're talking school photography, Andy, yes, it probably is. I'm being flippant, of course. Um, but landscapes, uh, probably not, no. No, I mean, photography, most genres, no. I don't expect they're supposed to be dangerous. This morning, says Andy, I feel a dangerous story coming along. I decided to go to my favourite spot, Rocky Point, Warwick, Rhode Island. I wanted to get a different angle of the pier which meant getting closer to the water. And to do that, I had to climb down the rocks. Watch out for the black rocks, I said to myself. Well, I think <laughs> you know where this is going. Yes, I suspect we all do. I hit a black rock and down I went, right on my shoulder. Ouch, the pain. After brushing myself off, did you do that thing where you... Oh, it wasn't me, I didn't fall down. No, oh, no, no, I meant to do that. I, uh, after brushing myself off, I still managed to set up my tripod and grab some shots. Ever the professional or amateur or, or phot no, ever the photographer. Yeah, that's what I meant. Ever the photographer. The pain got so bad, though, that, it, uh, uh, that sooner or later I had to go. Luckily, the fisherman there helped me climb up and get back to the top. And hospital, here I come. I now have third degree separation shoulder and collarbone. Oh, that doesn't sound very pleasant at all. Ooh, may need surgery. And uh, out of work now for three to four weeks. Blimey, but, says Andy, I got the shot. I feel we should have a hallelujah uh, jingle or something in the background, shouldn't we? I'm not singing again, really. Uh, Andy, you, you are a powerhouse photographer. But um, I am worried, actually. I may have been pronouncing your name wrongly. You're, you're, I saw that, um, because I, I'm going to link to your Insta, and I saw that actually you're an Andre, Andre, which means that uh, Thibault might be Thibault. Thibault? Thibault. Or am I talking too much Del Boy Trotter on this? Anywho, as they say, the pictures you suffered for are, of course, on the show page. <laughs> so you can see... Uh, well, they're, they're not the before and afters. They are most certainly the afters, aren't they? You can see those pictures. And uh, I will link to his Instagram as well. Uh, and if you uh, have had a similar uh, situation, something that you've done like that, then I'd love to hear from you. Neil, that sounds rather cruel. No, I don't mean it in a cruel sense. Send your mails, please, to studio at photographydaily.show. You can probably hear the rushing of water in the background. I'm uh, approaching one of these, uh, one of these locks along the, uh, along the canal. I think I'll just take a pew here for the, uh, for the final link shortly. Before that, though, let's hear from the, uh, well, let's hear the second chapter and concluding part to my conversation with Sandra Catania Odorno, the Brazilian photographer who in her 60s, and quite by accident, uh, becomes a photographer with such a good eye and, and good heart. And, uh, oh, there's another train. You missed that one as well, Neil. I know, look at that. What a picture. The canal, the old bridge. Why didn't you lift your camera? Well, I'm near, I'm near a lock and water 
and I'd rather like to save the microphone. We'll get one in a while. I'll take one home to him, to Thomas, that is. So, sorry, yes, Sandra Catania Adorno, the Brazilian photographer who, in her 60s and quite by accident, becomes a photographer with such a good eye and a good heart and definitely a, a good nose for a story and subject. She becomes an internationally published photographer. You will love her story and we complete our second chapter visit to her. Uh, last week, Sandra, we concentrated more upon your own personal photographic origins, this, this making of a photographer who, prior to being age 60, had picked up a camera only a handful of times, and, and now you're, you're internationally published, your latest book being this, this wonderful story of life on the beach in the, in the shadow of Sugarloaf Mountain, the music, the dancing, the football, the, the energy of Brazil, rather than, as you called it, the, the other side. So let's, let's talk a little more. Uh, this week about the story you told. Then I want to get on to the most exquisite finish I've seen in a book for quite some time, quite quite literally a golden book. Like my first guest of last week, Miranda Remington, you didn't necessarily travel with a complete plan back to Brazil. You, you arrived with a feeling, but not necessarily a plan, did you? I went out in Rio. I said, look, I'm, I come back to Rio a few times a year. Yeah. I want to shoot, but I want to be safe. The problem is the beach is one of the safest places mm. because there are a lot of people, especially where I stayed. I always stayed near the water. So the people were looking at me. I didn't want to shoot in Rio in the little streets and alleys. I didn't want to go through that because that's not very safe and you can something bad can happen to you and my daughter she had two guns in her head wow. i had you know several cameras stolen so it does happen and you don't want to be in a situation that you're helpless no. so the beach was although there is you know there are problems on the beach also it's less they wouldn't hit you. They would steal your camera, but they wouldn't hit you because everyone is seen. So they would just grab the camera and run, run, run. Oh, go, yeah. But that didn't happen to you shooting on the beach. Oh, they stole my camera, yes. Oh, they did on the beach. It happened to you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But they didn't harm me. I, I know from your, your youth, actually, there was another story where you were kidnapped as well, although I, I don't necessarily want to go there today. But no, none of this, none of this um, has stopped you from, from obviously following your dream, making those pictures of the wonderful side of, of Brazil as you see it. The negative didn't stay with me. I wanted to see it in a positive way yeah. because... It's a whole system that is wrong. I mean, it's not the person. They have no no hope. It's so yeah. difficult with yeah. people with no hope yeah. for you to ask them to be, you know, fantastic human beings. So they have nothing. So it appears to me that the hope is actually on the beach, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's the fun time for them and the release of all the tensions. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to see. And I certainly do see it. Anonymity, though, is a strong thread running through the book. Silhouettes, the occasional camera movement, reflections in low surf along the, the shoreline, the, that, that low evening, beautiful sun gifting you the opportunity to make silhouettes and reflections all at the same time. Um, so tell me about why you decided to shoot it this way, because um, you see people and you see the action, but you don't always see their faces. I wonder that also. I wonder if it's the ghosts in my mind. I, I don't don't I don't really know. But there's a dark in the happy frame. Yeah. I think that's the dark side, the silhouettes. In a way, mm, maybe the unknown. The who knows what is happening there. I don't know. I wonder also why. Because I always shoot that way. There's no other way. It's always against the sun. Always. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to see their faces. It's as if, I don't know, it's as if they're ghosts. But we do come to the presentation of this book. It's a very tactile book. A gold and metallic sheen. It runs across most pages. 
uh, save the the, uh, the section of the book in the middle. It's unlike pretty much every other book I've ever held. What was the thought behind it? Well, this was the very, very intelligent editor that I have. Yeah. David Chicky from Radius Books. Because, okay, this book, if you just put page after page of the same place, it's the same place, the same beach, yeah. you get bored after a while. And I think he thought, well, okay, doing these different metallic inks, you go up and down and it makes it in the middle, it's blue, so it breaks it. Yes. So it makes a little bit more interesting because if not, it's it wouldn't be so interesting. And he was the one, and not only he was the one to have the idea, but also we didn't know if it would print well. Mm. It could have been very tacky. We didn't know if the gold would be a nice gold. And we just found out that when we were in Verona printing. And he said, Sandra, you have to uh, have a leap, leap of faith because no one knows if it's going to come out. And I said, well, let's try. Yeah. Because there was no way of trying it before really trying it with the machines. I was very surprised and very, very happy. Well, it's come out beautifully. Um, I talk to photographers when, they're, when we're talking about a specific book, and we often talk about a, a specific moment, perhaps, um, oh, I don't want to call it a hero image because it's such an overused commercial word, but, but if, there's, if there's a signature image, if there's a moment within there where you think, Sandra, I remember that particular moment, that day, that particular person. Oh, it was the first one that I shot that is the cover. Ah. That one was the first one, the first picture I shot in Ipanema. Yes. And my husband was beside me and saying, let's hurry. We are late for the movies. And I said, please, <laughs> shoot a little bit more. <laughs> there's a throng of people, isn't there? There's, there's um, umbrellas, there's flags, there's people running into the surf, running out. There's almost like, it feels almost like there's a sandstorm happening as well. I'm you sure. know what? It oh, was uh, two days before. Before there was a horrible accident in Brazil, in Rio. Right. There was a, a place that the bicycles go, yeah. and the sea was so rough that two were, that they killed the, these two guys oh, no. because it was such a rough sea. Yeah. So everyone after this trauma in Rio, everyone was: Do I get into the water? Don't I get into it? Am I going to die? Am I not going to die? Everyone was screaming. But they wanted to go to the sea. So it was such an amazing day because it was also very traumatic because two people had died yeah. because of the sea. So that was the picture that I think began. It was my first picture of Ipanema. And that's when I said, yes, I think I'll dedicate something to Ipanema. Although my husband, until today, I tell him, if he had, if we hadn't gone to the movie, I would have had better <laughs> pictures. <laughs> well, I think that picture says, says so much, particularly after your story associated with it. Alex and Rebecca Webb, um, they, they did have, did they have some input on the book with you? Oh, yes, they have. When I finish the book, I do my sequence. Yeah. I do a A list and a B list. I send it to them. I ask them, for them to see if my sequence is what they think, if there's a, a B photo that is better than an A photo. And then after they help me with that, I go to David at Radios in um, pub Santa Fe. Publisher, yeah. And then he redoes, I mean, then he does it another third version because that's the editor's version that it has to do with the paper, with the layout, with blah, blah, blah. so it has to do with something else. But, I mean, it's three steps. Myself, then Alex and Rebecca, and David has the last say. Mm. And then there's, there seems to me there's a fourth step, or maybe it comes as fifth or sixth, I don't know, where you actually hold the book in your hand for the first time. Do you remember what that felt like, particularly given the nature of this book and how so very different it is in terms of the printing? It was fabulous. Yeah, it I was bet. amazing. Yeah. It was fabulous. It was Wow, it's like a baby being born. <laughs> it's really amazing. Yeah. It's it's such a satisfaction, yeah. such a satisfaction. I was so happy. I mean, so I'm I'm so so happy. Mm. 
photography gave me something that I would never, you know, I lived in my little bubble with my little things, with my little daily life. Yeah. Photography made me look around me, yeah. made me see people, made me pay attention to interactions, to the eyes of people, to to everything. It, it's a different world that I now have that I didn't, and I would have died without knowing it. So it's really a lot of fun. And I'm much more observant than I was. So, for example, when I left the printer EBS in Verona, I was going to the airport my last day, and I passed by these enormous metallic sheets yeah. on the floor with my pictures one overlaid on top of the other. Yeah. And I called them from the cab. I said, what were those? And they said, oh, those sheets, we, we clean them with a solvent, and then we reuse it. I said, oh, please don't clean mine. Please, I want to buy mine, because it's my pictures overlaid in a big metal thing. And it's great, because what, some are yellow, some are shocking pink. You know, it looks like Andy Warhol. It's fabulous. I said, please don't clean mine. I want to buy. And they said, no, I'll, we'll give you five. So I have these five at home. Yeah. And because of that observation, I'm doing my third book. And that is? This is called in Italian, scarti, which means things that you throw away. And so my book is going to be my pictures overlaid exactly like this so but it's observation because in your life sometimes you don't see things no. so i'm becoming more aware of what is happening and that helps you to create new things fabulous i mean these these are light bulb moments but i i asked this question of a photographer only a week or three back and i'm going to close with it with you because of your lifestyle your nomadic lifestyle as we as we've identified <laughs> here's an airline ticket where's it going to take you i'll make it first class so you can travel there in style too but where do you want to go i think the most important thing for me would be a place that has sun because i like to shoot with vivid colors yeah. it has color yeah. and has a lot of people and exotic people I think that's the place. It's not a place. It's a, It could be any place that has these things. Well, it sounds like we've just sent you back to Rio. <laughs> but there are many others <laughs> like that. <laughs> Sandra Catania Ordorno. I know. Uh, I know. We spoke with Sandra on the Fuji Cast, but uh, I couldn't wait to to have a chance to to chat with her personally, and I, I'm so pleased to have featured her work and her story in the show over the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm just before we, um, we close up today, I want to... Um, that was a bit surgical, wasn't it? Before we close up, ew, I want to get a picture of this, uh, this lock. I love locks. I think they're amazing on, on canals, the, the, sort of the lock systems. Amazing invention, really, aren't they? Um, the date's back, what, hundreds of years? Maybe further. Let me just get a get a picture this one's half empty this one but with a wonderful um victorian bridge behind with actually more of those uh those tank traps or whatever they were called let's get a picture one two fifth uh five six i've had to open up a bit because it's quite dark it's darkened off today quite a lot i fear some rain is on the way we probably just gonna beat it you know so uh ISO 400, here we go. Another one of those. Another one. Perfect. Right. Well, what have we learned today? Uh, well, I'm so pleased to have had the chance to, uh, well, via Barnabas Hummelik and Slovakia land to go to, to, to talk about the, the power of sound and to go into that a little bit further and how, how it it can add a, another dimension or texture texture that's the word i was i was flailing for here uh, in your picture making and uh, i do hope you go to the show page to to see those pictures and uh, you can match it with a sound that you've heard on the podcast today and barnabas from now on hold on to those recordings 
you know how precious they are. Uh, and yes, I learned that uh, quite a few of us are, well, not me yet, yet, he says, are calling our cameras names. They have names, so I'd be fascinated to learn yours. Send that to studio at photographydaily.show. Thanks to Richard Yarp's architectural pictures that he sent. I'm, I'm going to go and do that brutalist project, Richard. Um, I, I, it's not incredible that there are people in our lives all around us that have, um, that have projects to make pictures of that we haven't thought of before. My brother-in-law just happened to mention, he said, well, you know, you know I live in a brutalist building. There's architecture. And I thought, yes. I mean, every, every time I've been there, I've never really thought of it as a photographic project. And it is. And I'm now a firm Calvin and Hobbes fan. I hope you'll go look at the amazing story of the street photographer also that, uh, that went to be a cab driver purely for his photographic work. Because I forgot to point that out, that the, uh, the cab driver that we were talking about, uh, Ryan, in uh, New York City, he, he, he was a street photographer. He only went to be a cab driver because he, he thought that would make a, a great photographic project. Fantastic. Um, and Andy Tibolt, I hope your shoulder is on the mend very soon. Thanks to, thanks to my amazing guest today as well, Sandra Catania Adorno and Paul Sanders. Links to their work on the, the web show page today. And we're going to play out, I think. Now, I nearly did it last week and I thought, no, I can only do it one week or the other. And so I chose to do it the second week of, uh, of Sandra's appearance. I'm going I'm to play out with something a little Latin, I think. A nod to Sandra and Brazil. I'll do that quietly because I'm very close to the fishermen now. Um, now, I know, I know the English language version of this song that's coming up very well indeed. I've, I've used it in a film that I made. It's a, it's a wonderful song by Anthony Lazaro. It's called A Thousand Little Fires and it sounds even better, I think, with this, uh, or in this Latin version. Nella stanza sono tutti stesi, i loro cuori ti hanno visto e si sono resi. Ti guardo nello specchio e penso, ma come fai? La mente torna indietro al nostro primo incontro, storia, letto fine come in un racconto. Ti dico che sei bella e tu scherzi, ma quando mai? Dove siamo adesso? Nei tuoi occhi la parte migliore di me Io volo sul mondo Amanti nello spazio Baci in slow motion sul set Se vorrai volare, se cade come un tramonto a luglio, sei il primo bacio che non puoi scordare. E quando tra di noi la tensione sale, mi basta il tuo sorriso per dimenticare. Non servono parole quando siamo più e te. E dove siamo adesso? E noto nei tuoi occhi parte migliore di me è un volo sul mondo amanti nello spazio baci in slow motion sul set
Thousand Little Fires, Anthony Lazaro. I feel very blessed this week to have spoken with Sandra Catani Ordono and, of course, Paul Sanders, who frankly leaves me feeling just a, a sense of deep, genuine calm whenever I've spoken with him. So thank you, Paul. My, uh, my thanks to the patrons this week for supporting this show and, of course, MPB. You're part of a team and I'm grateful for you being there. It'd be a, it'd be a very quiet week without you. Uh, tomorrow in the Moore Show for Patroneers, my diary show, which could change dramatically if the lateral flows produce a line in the wrong place. However, I do know that I'll be featuring the work of Fran May, who's, uh, who's moved from Canada to a rather dour England in context of where she'd been and where she moved. Her pictures in, the, in this book, 1974 to 1978, well, they'll be the topic of our book club at least. Next week, we talk fashion, portraits, cultural change and what it's like to photograph the world's most famous woman and then i'd never really seen a picture of her smiling but i'd read so much about her having this really wicked very sharp sense of humor so the thing in my head was that i wanted to somehow capture that but also create a surface of this perfection and then I wanted to have the Union Jack in the background as a kind of nod to the Sex Pistols and Jamie Reed. so because obviously in, in my head I was a kind of pseudo punk um, so um, it was the, the combination of those three things were what, what sort of brought me to the shoot and and then she just didn't disappoint. She was just exactly kind of sharp and funny and witty and self-deprecating, but kind of really powerful. You know, she just, it was it was a really amazing four minutes. No, anonymously as Rankin. He's not one to hold back his thoughts and feelings about photography. And he's our special guest next week on the show. Music today from the incredible artlist.io. I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.